today uh, we have uh, our own Tony Fatali <laughs> doing our first uh, research presentation for the Petrosian Center, which is based on a research grant he received uh, last year. And after this one, in November, Hilda Branco will be doing another one uh, on sustainability uh, in cities in California. So welcome you all and welcome Tony. Okay, well, thanks. <laughs> Well, thanks for coming, everyone. I, uh, um, the title is uh, sort of promises a lot, right? So I, uh, and this is a research agenda into which I've dug for uh, about seven years. So we can, I, I can talk back and forth about, uh, about individual issues, but uh, um, it, so, so please ask questions if, if uh, things aren't, aren't clear, okay? And so it's a big question about why governments emphasize certain policies and not others, right? And you might be surprised to learn that we don't really have a good answer to this in the literature, right? And part of it has to do with the way that we think about the relationship between policy priorities and representation, which I'll get into um, in a bit. And that's, that's one uh, um, contribution that we're attempting attempting to make. And what we're doing in order to think about policy priorities in a constructive way is we're drawing on some tools from, from financial economics. And so if you have, if you have a little bit of basic um, a, a familiarity with uh, asset pricing, you might see some familiar things in these slides. But they do have, a, I, I think, profoundly political meaning in the way that I'm describing them, right? And so the way in which we use these com concepts is quite different than what you would have seen in, in the asset pricing mm -hmm. literature. So we, we do another thing that is new to the literature, and that is to tie prioritization, right, or just levels of policy attention, how much politicians talk about something, right, or the, the just levels of attention in various areas in which politicians are able to, um, to discuss particular policy areas. We tie that to elections, right? Now, we've done this in, in Britain in a, in a fuller way, but here um, I'm reporting on some preliminary stuff from the, um, from the, the study that the, the grant um, finance. So, so we will be comparing Britain and Spain in limited periods. I was involved in the British project, and so it's our fault that the last two years were not collected. And so the time periods do not entirely match up. But they're pretty interesting time periods, as you can imagine, to think about prior policy prioritization, because they're, they're punctuated by a, uh, um, a worldwide financial crisis. Okay? So <clears throat> anybody who, right, so Matt and others who were in uh, um, the policy seminar have seen theories of the policy making process, right? And if you know these literatures, you find these kinds of sites familiar. But I'd like to use them to tell you why I don't think we have a very good answer to the question of, of why governments prioritize one policy area and not another, right? So one literature we might call opinion responsiveness. And opinion responsiveness kind of works like this. The public is interested in something. They find it important. Government responds by giving it more attention. The public is then satiated somehow through a relatively underspecified mechanism and moves on to something else. And so it's this constant marginal adjustment that is the essence of representation through political attention, right? And so <clears throat> in the book we call this naive responsiveness because it's simply on the margin. Right? It's not something that's driven by any understanding of the state of the world or anything else, right? Characteristics of politicians. There's no statesmanship here. It's just responsiveness to trends in public opinion, right? There's a literature on party positioning and competition. The sites in there are from both American and, and comparative politics. And this stresses the preferences about policies of the median voter, 
and attempts to get close to the, to the policy preferences of the median voter, right? So politicians try to summarize <coughs> the distribution of preferences out there. And then when they do summarize this, they try to respond to the, to the, to the important summary statistic, right? These models are spatial, and there's a left-right character to them, right? The ideology of a policy is important, right? In opinion responsiveness, as well as what I'm talking about today, the question is just attention, right? And so we, one of the extensions is to put an ideological characteristic on this, but right now we just want to think about levels of attention, right? So not left-right. There's a, there's a uh, um, literature we might call endogenous agenda shaping, which is about <coughs> the way in which external forces create different epochs in policy making and policy attention, right? So the financial crisis happens and there's a different level of attention to, uh, um, to securities regulation and these kinds of things. Or <coughs> the policy diffusion literature, right? The state next to you does something, and so you adopt similar kinds of policies, right? And so these kinds of literatures are suggesting also a question of why we pay attention, why governments pay attention to some policies and not others. But it's a very different mechanism than that related to public opinion or that related to the ideology of parties, right? A fourth literature is one we might call endogenous agenda setting. And this is the, the literature that developed a focus on policy attention from which we're drawing our data, right? And the argument here is that governments can't solve all kinds of problems. Like <clears throat> any actor that is characterized by bounded rationality, these actors cannot make synoptic decisions, right? They cannot engage in the kinds of nuanced opinion responsiveness that would, that would happen on the margin here, right? So in order to fully understand what it is that the public wants and make the appropriate response, we, we, don't, we don't really expect that our governments have that kind of capability, right? Now, government, governments are big organizations, and there are reasons why we would expect this, this kind of action to ensue. But the upshot of a John, a endogenous agenda setting is that there are long periods of stable agendas and then big shifts, right? So we don't see anything happen until it happens in a really big way, right? So the, uh, um, the relationship between the policy agenda and sort of geology is what they, what they bring up, right? They call this punctuated equilibrium. Um, and we get this sense that, that uh, epics reign in policy attention. And then things suddenly change. And when they suddenly change, we're into a new era, which will reign until the next big change, right? And the final literature, which is closer to the kind of thing that we're, we're thinking about, is the economic voting literature. And so rather than thinking about a whole variety of issues, which we're after, right? We want to talk about a portfolio of issues, right? The economic voting literature focuses on one thing, the economy, and postulates that if, if politicians get the economy right, then they've really done something. And that is going to translate into electoral reward, right? And so the economic voting literature unlike the others, makes that final leap into connecting, uh, by connecting this policy priority problem to the outcome that uh, politicians want, which is to be reelected and stay in power, right? And so each one of these literatures goes at a piece of this question, right? So you can see that a lot of them suggest how government responds to public opinion or how government prioritizes, but don't really offer a theory of why, except for economic voting, 
which simply says that it's an aspect of voter preferences that then gets translated into, into uh, vote share, right? And so that is similar to what we do. And I will, um, I will walk you through the basic, the basic argument and the investment metaphor, which some people, particularly those in the endogenous agenda setting literature, think that we overplay in this work, is something that captures a, that, that carries with it a little bit of baggage in terms of terminology. So I'm going to walk you through that first, and then we'll start looking at some, some data as we go along, right? So I can show you what these kinds of things look like. So our argument proceeds basically like this, that, that governments are able to construct expectations about the value that the public attaches to their policy priorities, right? So if you think about opinion responsiveness, governments will not just respond to public opinion because it's in the nature of democracy, but because they see some value in doing so. We're going to give this value some electoral um, benefit, right? So you will want to vote for a government that prioritizes in a way that you think is, is reasonable, right? And so, Public priorities, then, are part of what we call policy price signals in this, in this, uh, um, in this uh, project, right? And so these, just like willingness to pay of the public or, or, or willingness to pay of consumers for particular goods, are what the public, uh, they're signals of the importance and the value of attention to these particular kinds of policies, right? These things, however, are not just the expression of public opinion. They're underlying something else, right? And so we'll talk about how these values are calculated because it's central to the, to the framework. So government then relies on these signals when it's selecting the policies it emphasizes, right? <clears throat> and the literature, which many of you are familiar with on the policy agenda, right, our relationship between, uh, the relationship between this project and studies of the policy agenda is we think about the attention profile, if you will, of a government as its policy portfolio, right? And so constructing that policy portfolio represents one aspect of the policy agenda. It re represents, in this case, and I want to be clear about this, a distinctly non-ideological one. Right? So we don't care what government says, just how much attention they pay. Right? So the bar is fairly high for us to find an electoral effect here because we're divorcing this a bit from, from uh, partisan leanings. And that's, a, that's a, a sticky problem and one that we'll, uh, I'll talk about sort of at the end of the talk on, on future extensions here. So keep that in mind. So, the policy portfolio then is valued. It's the mix of policy topics that the government pays attention to. And it has value in some of the work that we've done. We've, we've explicitly partialed out the value of what political scientists call valence characteristics or the reason why you like your candidate. He's tall, he sounds smart, right? Or he doesn't sound smart in many cases. Um, and, uh, and partisanship itself, right? So the yellow dog effect. I would never vote for a Democrat ever, and so no matter who the Republican candidate is, I just run, right? So there's raw partisanship that has absolutely nothing to do with the characteristics of the candidate, and that, uh, um, that, that is, this policy portfolio performance is over and above those kinds of things, right? So, I'll start to show you some of these moving parts, and essentially, we want to think about the government as sort of a fund manager for the public, if this metaphor is going to work, right? So the government makes some, some investments on behalf of the, of the public. It pays attention to these, to these policies in particular levels. And so government chooses what we call investment weights, and we call policy domains then policy assets. These are just collections of policies that make some sense as being held together as a category by the public, right? 
So the public is not good at drawing out the distinctions between the environmental policies that those of you who are interested in environmental policy can do, right? General members of the public can't do this. So they collect up something called environmental policy, right? And that environmental policy is something that sounds like, well, it costs me more money at the pump, but at least I can still go to Lake Tahoe, something like that, right? So it's not, we're not putting an, an absurd amount of pressure on the public to think that they can distinguish, for example, a cap and trade solution from a carbon tax solution that shows up in a, uh, um, in a bill, right? But we're giving them a sense that environmental policy is something that can be weighed against econo macroeconomic policy, for example, or foreign affairs and defense and things like that, right? And so that's what these policy assets are. And in Britain and Spain, three of the 12 that we analyzed look like this over the study period, right? So one thing that you can see here is that and where these, I'll, I'll tell you where these uh, government investment weights come from. In Britain, there's a, there's a thing called the speech from the throne. Has anybody ever seen one of these? Essentially, at the beginning of the, at the opening of every parliamentary session, the Queen sort of rides through St. James's Park in some gilded, um, some gilded carriage and then delivers a speech at the opening of Parliament that is ex exceedingly boring and it is the process of deliberation by the prime minister and cabinet, right? And it basically reads like this. My government will introduce a bill that, right? Or I will be going to, you know, South Africa to do these kinds of things, right? So notice the speech has some policy commitments in it and it has some just general discussion, right? And so what we're focusing on is the policy content of these speeches, the bill introductions. And though this comes out of the Queen's mouth because of the constitutional framework in Britain, this is the agenda of the government, right? And in a coalition government like um, what we have in Britain now, the coalition together puts this out, right? And so in order to understand partisan Forces, which we, will, which we will do not in this talk, but later, that's, uh, that's where we're getting it. In Spain, there are a couple of, of times in a year when this can happen, right? The king gives a speech that's very similar to this, and also there's an investiture speech that happens. So in, in Spain, there are two different speeches that can happen, but essentially what these speeches do is announce the policy platform of the government in that year, right? And so this, it would be nice if we could say this compares to, say, the President's State of the Union, right? But these are parliamentary systems which make the investment metaphor stronger because in the President's State of the Union, the President states what's going to happen, what, it's, what he's going to present to Congress, and then Congress can have some say over that, right? And so this notion of the ability to, to veto some of these choices is something that's very important in the separation of power systems. And it's one thing to keep in mind, I'll tell you a little bit about um, Spanish politics to motivate this, but in Spain, there's a little bit more of a challenge than in Britain, right? So in Britain, this is as close to a single policy investor as you can find, right? And in part of the time period here, right, before 2010, there was only one party in government, right? So this is one party choosing these kinds of things. One thing that you can notice right here, and it's something that we consistently find in the case of Britain, is that Britain is fairly reserved in how it moves its policy priorities around, right? So you can see the percentage of quasi-sentences in the speech from the throne over here, right, that is devoted to any one of these policy areas, right? And certainly after 2008, 10% of the speech is finally spent on, uh, on uh, economic policy, right, on macroeconomic policy, in spite of the fact that there's a, there's a meltdown, right? And so we see the British government being able to, to uh, keep these kinds of, keep these investment weights more stable. We want to try to understand how the British government 
invests in this way and how it selects its attention. And in Spain, you see some wild shifts, right? So 2008 in macroeconomic policy changes the, the game um, pretty dramatically, right? And so a, over a third of the speech then becomes, uh, these speeches then become the purview of, of macroeconomic policy. And there are a lot of these um, policy assets. Let me just skip ahead here to give you a sense. So what we've done is the, the policy agendas project, which I was, a, I was a part of the British version of this, but the, the Baumgartner and Jones work in the US is what got this all started. The policy agendas project created 21 major topic codes. In the data that we use, right, we don't, we don't have all of these codes represented, so we have brought this down to about 12 categories that we use, right? So rather than 21, we keep these, we keep these numbers just for, uh, um, this was in a paper that was drawing from the policy agendas process project. But we've, we've had to recode a bit because not all of these codes make sense, right? And also, it's part of this, I suppose, what's exciting and frustrating about these comparative projects is that a coding frame that was developed in the United States in post-war America doesn't necessarily represent the sets of policies that the Spanish government talks about since 2000 or that the British government talks about since 2000 in this kind of case as well, right? So, so essentially, though, beyond macroeconomics and environment and what was my third one? Labor, right? The, the uh, um, government has to balance a number of these different kinds of assets, if you will, in its policy portfolio. So choosing this level of attention and, and trying to understand the policy agenda through this investment metaphor means that government looks at this list of, of policies that the public can distinguish, right? These policy domains that the public can distinguish and chooses how much attention to pay to it, okay? So the state of the world then affects both public perceptions, right, and some other aspects of politics that, that we can talk about at the end. But the state of the world sort of reveals itself. And when, so think about the economic crisis, right? The economic crisis happens, and that, and that, that crisis affects the public's perceptions of the importance of particular policy issues, right? But government, and so government, if it was just going to respond on the margin, it might respond to horribly inflated importance of economic issues, right? It might not be considering the expectation of the state of the world that it already has, right? It might know that, uh, that, that the importance of, of macroeconomic issues has been trending upward for some time. Or it might have known last month right, that macroeconomic issues were likely to be a big thing this month, right? And so it could adjust its projections and be more balanced in this way and not just respond on the margin, right? And so this kind of anticipation of the effect of the state of the world on the public's policy priorities is a key to the approach. That's where the asset pricing piece comes in. It's trying to understand, have government understand the, um, the effect. And we call these things competence factors for the following reason. It's a term that, that maybe haunts us a little bit because some, some commenters don't really understand what it means. So I'll try to explain it to you. So if, if Government is, in order to engage in this kind of business, if, in, in order to engage in representation through this kind of responsiveness, right? Government has to try to understand what is really important to the public, not just that which is shocked by a current event, right? And so when government is anticipating these kinds of things, 
that public opinion is conditioned by these things in the state of the world that make it more or less competent to respond to public opinion, right? So the competence aspect of this is competence in representation, if you will. The ability, so the world is making it more or less difficult for the public to, uh, or for the government to understand what it is that the public really prioritizes, right? That's the notion of, of competence factors, and they have to be unexpected volatility, right? So it's not just the factor that is revealed, it's unexpected volatility. Right, and so we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, so in Spain, these are a list, I don't know if you can see this, <laughs> but these are a list of things that the public that might actually be, that are revealed as, as aspects of the state of the world that the public might actually care about, right? So changes in levels of globalization, right? Financial markets. Crude oil prices and other kinds of things that, that affect uh, um, economic well-being, right? Payrolls, gross domestic product, trade balances and imb imbalances, environmental impact from greenhouse gas emissions, um, education, um, it, 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 the, the impact of, of, uh, of finishing education, right? So we're, we're finding a lot of these kinds of um, indicators, but our theory is not saying that any one of these things is always priced. That's what the economic voting literature says. The economic voting literature says the public cares about something like inflation, right? We're trying to be extensible here. We've got a whole lot of different policies that the public has to pay attention to, right? And so we want to make sure that our theory doesn't postulate these kinds of specific these kinds of specific influences because it most likely will be wrong in, in many cases, right? And so essentially all we want to say, our, our conclusion here, or our argument here is to say that once there's a representation of sort, some sort of key aspects of the state of the world and we partial that out from the signal about policy priorities, we get something more stable, right? and we get something that the government responds to. So government is actually a little bit smarter than a naive responder to public opinion. Government tries to take what it can, what it expects about the state of the world and pull it out of public opinion and then respond to, uh, respond to that, more, um, that more reasonable signal of what policy priorities are. And so in, so in the end, right, what I want to do is I want to say these are the kinds of things that matter. And I can add more of these as data become available, right? And good, reasonable indicators become available. But I'm going to do, in this case, a principal components analysis. And I'm going to partial out of public opinion signals about the priority of particular, uh, of, of particular policies. These different components. So I'm reducing this complex state of the world to a few different things, right? And so my theory says these things matter, but it doesn't tell you what these things actually are, right? So if you've ever seen an arbitrage pricing framework in, a in, in asset pricing, it's a similar kind of argument, right? The factors are not specifically identified. Now there are two schools of thought on that in finance, which is outside the, the scope of this talk, but essentially the notion is that it's, that it, it's trying to understand this state of the world and how it's revealed, right? So those are realized. Those are what we actually see in a given period, right? But I did say that things have to be unanticipated. So thinking a little bit about political time and using a little regression trick, right? So this is the, unexpected, the unexplained portion, the residual from what the factor looks like in one period based on, based on what, the, what anybody saw the last period, right? So the residual of the realization on the one month, in this case, lag of the, the realization. So 
My best projection, at least according to our assumption here, of what the factor is going to look like next month is what it looks like this month. And the extent to which we are wrong is the unexpected volatility here. And those are the things that shock the confidence of the government. So if they didn't see it coming from last month, then this is, this is what happens, right? And so in political time, we're not worried about very complicated trends to try to smooth this out. We're dealing with, a, we're trying to create a realistic picture of politicians looking at things in the present, right? And so we, in the different projects, we look at different lengths of time, right? In this case, from a year to a month in, in the case that we're talking about. And one thing that you'll see here is if the expectation is just that simple, if all you're saying is these aspects of the state of the world are, reveal their, uh, re reveals themselves, this is confidence factor one, which is largely related to globalization and the economy, right? So in the UK, the expectations seem to be a little bit smoother than in Spain, right? So in Spain, last month, you probably, you're probably getting something entirely different this month, right? Yeah. Yeah, and this is a regression residual, so the expected value you would, what you would expect is zero, right? You would expect last month to perfectly predict this month, right? And this is simply the extent to which it, it doesn't. So I talked about public opinion being a, a signal here, right? There is some way in which the public reveals, right, what its priority is over a particular policy. And that comes from, uh, we tap a couple of different surveys. And this is, you know, another welcome to comparative politics. In Britain, the question is a random sample of a thousand people and they ask a question, what do you think is the most important issue facing Britain, right? And in Spain, they ask, I have, you know, what do you think are the three most important problems facing Spain, right? So if you study surveys, those are two very different kinds of things, right? There's some work that suggests that the most important issue versus the most important problem isn't a, isn't a massive difference. But this one most important issue versus one of three most important problems is a real problem for our analysis right now. And so we're trying to think of other data sources, but right now I'm going to analyze these totally separately, these two countries, because of this problem. But essentially you can see what the problem is. This is just macroeconomic policy, right? Macroeconomic policy in, uh, <coughs> in Britain, obviously in 2008 you see this jump to 50% or more of the public saying that it's the most important issue facing Britain. One of the three most important issues, it's always over 50% in Spain, right? And now when we aggregate it up it's over 100% because of the way that the, the question is asked, right? So again, we don't really get, in, in this comparison, I don't really have a good unified way because of the way that the questions are asked. But again, we both get a, a, some understanding of, in this case, the importance to the public of macroeconomic policies is going up, right? The priority for the public is going up, right, in both cases. But I can't compare these scales, and so I'm not, I'm not going to do that in this discussion. This notion that I'm talking about of trying to understand the value of these, of these policies through an asset pricing framework comes down to this. And I'll just show you a couple of little equations that aren't very difficult to, to understand, right? So this guy, these measures of opinion, are going to be what we call VI here, right? And so VI is a function of those factors that I showed you before, that unanticipated volatility in the, uh, um, the, the way that the state of the world is revealed to the public, right? And so if we condition these things out, right, we can see, captured by these betas, whether or not the public, and this is simply a regression framework, so whether or not the public thinks 
that this particular volatility is influential in um, shaping their priorities, right? So just whether or not that beta is statistically significant will tell us, will tell us the extent to which, uh, um, it will tell us whether or not the, the public cares, right? And <coughs> then what we can do is just through a little bit of algebra, we can say that if all of the world, right, if all of the world were compressed in just a shock from one factor, right, just the one that I showed you, for example, right, we can just set this beta equal to 1 and all the others equal to 0. And what we get in the intercept in that term is the um, risk premium from that particular factor to the, gover the government's competence, right? And when we multiply the sensitivity to that factor times this risk premium and add it up across all factors, we get the expected value of that asset, right? And so essentially what we're saying about the way that government looks at public opinion is not that it looks at the poll numbers raw, but that when it looks at the poll numbers, it also thinks about things that are unexpected in the state of the world. And it tries to clean up those numbers in the polling based on what it knows about the state of the world. That's what the argument is, it is essentially, right? So, so government doesn't naively respond to public opinion. It uses its knowledge of the state of the world to condition its understanding of what the public is trying to express in, in, its, uh, in opinion about its priorities, right? That's our argument about what government is doing here. And remember also, that we're talking about governments as an aggregate organization. I'm not talking about individual politicians, right? This is not, right, Congressman Issa's um, responsiveness to public opinion, right? Congressman Issa's responsiveness to public opinion might be strategically very localized and very unconditional, right? And so the, that kind of politics is something that we're, that we're not thinking about here. And we're thinking about what the institution does, how well, the institution makes this kind of response. That's what the, that's what the framework is about. Okay? And so government then invests, if you will, on this basis. It chooses its priorities on this basis. And it chooses its priorities by picking the level of attention. Right? And creating a portfolio out of a weighted sum of those values, right? So essentially when it, in the graphic that I showed you, spends 30% of its executive speech on the economy, it is choosing a level of importance for the economy and it's expecting that that level of importance, right, will translate into something of value, nam namely electoral performance, right? Uh, yeah. Sure. Does your theory applies only to parliamentary system? Well, that's, uh, this, actually a, this, actually a, this is a good question. So we started in Britain, and we did that for a reason, because what Jan says is absolutely right. It's a unified executive, and it's a unified um, legislative and executive, and a mm -hmm. parliamentary system with mm -hmm. a very peculiar character, right, mm -hmm. that gets it very close to the idea of a single individual, right, making this kind of decision. In the separation of powers where this kind of stuff is shared, that's very complicated. We're going to try to take this on in another, um, in a, in a, in another project. But in, it anticipates the difference between Spain and the UK. And I'll talk about that in a, in a few slides. But if I don't do that satisfying, in a satisfying way, just, just bring me back there, right? So when, when these competence shocks, if you will, are actually priced by the public, when, when the public actually cares that there was un unexpected volatility mm -hmm. in some of these state of the world, is characteristics of the state of the world, those create the challenges for governing. And part of the work that we did in Britain was tie this to a literature on statecraft and leadership and tried to look at the way we looked at these different uh, 
um, characteristics of, of, of pricing of these kind of confidence factors in different um, prime ministerial regimes and looked at the historical record and read it in light of these kinds of numbers, right? So we were, we were tying, albeit in a case study fashion, um, to, the, uh, to the literature on, on uh, executive leadership as yeah, well. Sorry, can I yeah, oh sure, please. So what is actually the actual driver of the whole theory? Could the same thing apply to modeling the Communist Party policy making in China? If you believed be that, same, right? I mean, if you believed that responsiveness was something that the Communist Party had to, they do want to be responsive. Yeah, but there's nothing in the nature of communism that requires responsiveness, as it does in democracy. And I, I, we'll see. We'll see if you're satisfied with this because that is the nature of our claim about conditional representation, right? that we are talking about representation because in this sort of Pitkin world, there is, a, there is a very important aspect of representation that is called responsiveness, right? So in, in a Chinese communist system, is that an assumption, right? And I think it would be harder to argue that it was, right? To the extent that they want to respond for some other reason, Right, you could create that, but it is in the nature of democracy to have responsiveness somewhere, and I want to couch all this in, in a sort of notion of, of uh, representation as well. No, it just assumes that government cares about that in this. And in this book that we did, there's a there's a formal piece that ties it directly to vote share. Right, so the more you get, the more you get these. Uh, um, uh, the more you get what we call policy capital from that, uh, from those portfolios, right, the better your vote share, right? And we show some statistical evidence of that, and I'll show you some here as well. Okay. So this estimation, we can talk about this if you like, but I don't want to, I don't want to drone on unnecessarily, but essentially, um, we're applying that framework in a panel here across policy areas, right? So we're pooling, we're pooling all these different policy categories, and I'm getting these betas for the sensitivities and the risk premia, the lambdas, from, from these estimations. And then I'm going to apply that pricing equation. I'm going to get the expected value, right? Um, conditional on these, uh, um, on this, what's revealed from the state of the world, right? And I'm adjusting the standard errors and thinking about this because <coughs> one thing that is absolutely clear in this political framework, right? And this, this, is, this is something that has to be understood, is that nobody expects this mar market to clear, right? And also, unlike a, a financial market, we don't think about you know, on average, some stocks will do well and some stocks won't do well. So we can diversify out, um, we can diversify out risk, right? So because this market doesn't work efficiently, we introduce this concept of what we call price signal noise or price signal uncertainty, right? There is some, there, there is some aspect of the state of the world that the public can just not process, right? And it's not going to reveal it clearly like a firm would do with its, with its uh, um, like, a, like a firm would do placing itself in a publicly traded stock market, for example, right? So, so I, I, want you to, I want you to understand that these errors, right, it is true that the government would like to make these kinds of calculations, but it's based on the quality of the information that they get from the public, right? So this goes to, this at least my way of addressing the kinds of concerns that, uh, that Jan had, right? Because if this is about politics, this has to at some, at some level be about representation, right? And so <coughs> we argue that constructing these policy portfolios helps us understand responsiveness, right? So this classic Pitkin view of, of uh, 
of democracy sees political representation as systemic, not individual, right? It's the system that is representing. It's not individual politicians. It's not the prime minister, right? It's, it's the system, right? And so what we want to see is how the system puts these kinds of things together. And responsiveness has to have a character that it is not persistently at odds with the wishes of the represented without good reason. And this is the nature of tying it to the electoral connection, right? That is the accountability aspect, right? So the electoral connection can be seen in a couple of different ways. Um, we can talk about that if you like. But one way in which you can see it is, is as an accountability mechanism, right? Throw the bums out if they don't do what you want. And so we should expect there to be an association between this kind of, this kind of uh, conditional responsiveness and electoral values, right? Um, and it also, it also has some uh, relationship to what Mansbridge calls anticipatory representation, right? Note it's not about promises. And in the, in the uh, uh, book on Britain, we um, look at those promises through manifesto commitments, right? So parties write manifestos before elections and say, if you elect us, this is what we're going to do, right? And we can classify those in the same way that we do these executive speeches, right? And so that's, that's uh, we do look at these kinds of things. But anticipatory representation means, yeah, we may have said that, but we want to know what is expected to happen, right? If, if uh, um, you know, at the next election, right? We want to think about electoral rewards. We don't want to think about just sticking to our promises because our promises, first, might not get us rewarded. And second, might be actually in terms of substantive representation, they might be wrong. Sticking to our promises might actually be bad for you, right? And bad for everybody. So, so that's a piece of it. And so we claim that then once in office, the government, by choosing the different priorities in these speeches, right, can rebalance its portfolio, right? And responsiveness then is not direct, but it's both anticipatory, and it's also conditional on the characteristics of the attention market, right? The expected return from those policy price signals, the levels of risk or the volatility in those policy price signals, and then finally how clear they are how informed that regression analysis that we're saying is the basis of the way that government looks at it is done, right? So that's what we're, that's what we're after. Some sense of performance in any kind of investment is going to be a combination of those three things. And so I'll, I'll argue that to you, okay? So as I said, the public may not fully understand the, the world, and that's a challenge to anticipatory re representation because the public might give you some very nice uh, um, polling results, right? But those polling results might be shaped by the state of the world in a very ambiguous fashion, right? Technically, those sensitivities may not be significant, right? They may have very big standard errors, right? And particularly that risk premium right, where, uh, where the risk for it comes from only one factor, and then we use that as, the, as an essential part of that pricing equation. So the uncertainty in that calculation gives us some proxy for the level of clarity the public has in adjusting its opinion on the basis of the way that the state of the world comes along, right? And that's, that's, the, that's the essence of the idea. The example there is from the, the Falkland Islands crisis, right? So if the Falkland Islands crisis is really important in saying that, right, it's, it seems to increase the amount of attention that govern, or the, the amount of attention that it thinks the government should pay to foreign defense policy, but it does so in a very ambiguous way. There's a, that it's, it's creates a challenge for conditional responsiveness because 
we might think that the public wants us to talk about right, and pay attention to foreign and defense issues. But it turns out that we don't really know how, if that's because of the Falklands crisis or not. Right? So these, these pricing signals are very important as, for us to understand the conditions under which we see this kind of volatility and attention. Because if we simply naively respond to public opinion in this government, we may actually lose the election, right? Because we don't understand the sort of fundamentals of, of, of what are going on here, right? And so essentially that's going to be our notion of, uh, of public opinion or, or of uh, price signal uncertainty, and that's what I just said. And so the government is facing this kind of environment, right? So this is the expected value of paying attention to a particular issue, right? Or, it, or this is the expected value of its portfolio across all these issues, right? The dot, right? And so the expected volatility in that, or the, the standard deviation of that portfolio, the risk is, is that uh, big um, light shaded region. But price signal uncertainty covers a somewhat smaller region, right? So when the government thinks about its risk-taking behavior, right, the public can only really discern part of that risk-taking behavior because its own uncertainty about its priorities clouds its judgment on that kind of thing, right? So it's, a, it's an attempt to try to understand when, if government is going to engage in this kind of, in this kind of responsiveness, right? It has to think about the particular times in which, or the, the, the time in which it's doing it, right? And there are times when the public is just not clear, right? We find that throughout qualitative discussions of, uh, of uh, uh, government performance all the time, right? It's just not clear what the, what the public wanted, and it, you know, it completely shifted, a, it, it completely shifted away from, from the notion that, uh, it, the economy was the big problem because there were a bunch of strikes in the street and then the labor government falls in, in 1978 in what's called the winter of discontent, right? So the, the, the problem was that government had an expectation about what was valued, but it didn't have clear information about that from the, from the public. And it wants to, the government wants to think about this and so we create unsurprisingly a statistic called the Government Performance Index, which divides the portfolio return, that middle thing, by its risk, which is um, in turn divided by its uh, exposure to portfolio uncertainty, right? So the amount of this noise in the public signals that you get from uh, uh, the choices about priorities that you make, right, is something that, as you saw in that picture, reduces the public's ability to perceive the risk that you have. So you could be, as that goes up, right, you could, you could behave in a more risky fashion, right? And so this looks somewhat like a sharp ratio for those of you who invest, right? And so it's return um, th that is, uh, that is uh, divided by risk, right? But here, this notion that the risk may not clearly be perceived is something we want to include in the, in the framework. That's what we're after, okay? And so, this also to Jan's point, the big difference, and this is, this is all preliminary now, so I'm just going to show you some results to see whether or not this is going, and then, and then we can chat. So, both are parliamentary democracies, right? But there is a particular character to, uh, um, to these parliamentary democracies. In Spain, regionalism, both in parties and in control over particular topics, is particularly important. And what it does is it makes ambiguous the attribution of policy priority success, right? So is it the Catalan delegation? who was, who was uh, um, successful in getting health care on the agenda? Or was it the, the government in Madrid, right? 
it's more difficult because there, there are splits across it. And we can, we can talk, this, talk about this a little bit. But there are some formal um, shared powers, and then there are also some, some differences based on politics, right? And so essentially, in the, um, in the literature on comparative politics, there are more veto players in the Spanish system. There are more actors who can effectively veto these policy priorities, right? So regional parties can have an effect on the policy agenda, whereas in Britain, um, that we don't see that kind of thing, right? And so essentially, we, our initial expectations, right, and if these are wrong, then the whole thing is totally useless. So Spanish government should have more volatile policy in, uh, investment performance, right, because they're respond, there's, there's more ability to veto, and the ability to develop a consistent strategy like your investment manager is what is being stunted here, right? Um, and also, we argue that Spanish governments um, invest more in, in uh, assets that were previous successes, right? And British governments tend to take profits and stabilize, right? This is something we see in the, in the British um, work. But if you look at a lot of the literature on comparative politics and British politics in particular, there, is, uh, um, there are lots of metaphors in that, that talk about British distinctiveness as a steady pair of hands to steer the ship of state, right? There is a constancy, right? And a constancy comes from having fewer veto players in the, in the literature, right? But also we should expect to see stable returns in Britain and things flopping around in Spain like in this picture. And so this is that statistic about performance, right? And we can see this volatility here. I can do a relatively uninteresting difference in variances test that would tell you exactly what you see on that picture, right? But to think about hypothesis two, right, we're going to pull all 12 of these, um, these policy assets in this study. And we're going to look at the effect of a difference in value of individual assets, right, on the difference in investment, right? And so we would expect that if in the last period, right, the value based on our calculations goes up, then the Spanish government should invest more in that strategy. And the British government should take profits and disinvest to try to get that stability, right? So we should, that's what we should expect, right? And so that's what we see <coughs> in Britain. We see that, right, so the more uncertainty, right, the more this is, this is something that we're still thinking about, right? And we had in the, in the British case, we had a discussion of this in, at one point. But in the comparative context, we're still working on this. But for the purposes of time, this is the big story, right, that I want to, that I want to, spend time on, and that is that here you see the British government engaging in taking profits and uh, the Spanish government investing in past successes, right? And so we're starting to try to empirically get a sense of the difference in, in strategies of policy prioritization across these countries, right? For those of you who do case studies in comparative politics, most similar systems design there are these couple of differences, and that's what we're attributing, the differences here, right? So we don't have, we don't have tremendous um, power in here. This is not an experiment, but we're, we're, we're basing it on that kind of design. But the whole thing about conditional representation is that governments that get better performance in this, in this investment market um, get um, rewarded by the public at the ballot box, and, and this is really preliminary, as in I did it yesterday, <laughs> right? Um, pulled time series of, of government net of opposition vote share, right? So what this means is that we take the amount of vote share that the government gets, right, and 
decrease or, and subtract the amount that the primary opposition party gets, right? There are lots of parties out there, but we're looking at the primary opposition, the one that they're basically running against, right? And this is standard in this kind of literature. And we're doing this in regional elections, right? And so we're doing this in regional elections because general elections don't happen every year, right? And there's some other, there's some other uh, um, discussions that we're going to get. So this is very preliminary. Don't put, too much, um, don't put too much stock in this, right? But essentially, the regional elections in Spain are regional governments. The regional elections in Britain are local government elections, right? In Britain, they happen at the same time every year. In Spain, there can be a couple of elections in, in each year. And so what I want to do is a, adjust these standard, or I, I want to weight the, the, I want to incorporate in the regression some information about the number of elections per year. It, this preliminary result is robust to not thinking about it that way as well. But essentially, the GPI effect looks like this. And the, this coefficient is what I want to interpret. Right, so what I want to do is tell you some sense of how big this effect of GPI might be, right? And it's more like this. So if we go from the minimum to maximum GPI in, in, uh, um, in Spain, that's associated with a 20% increase in government net of opposition vote share, right? As I defined it, right? And there's the confidence interval. The average net swing like that, right? So ne by net swing, I mean swing in this government less opposition, right? Is 2.6 percent. So it's a pretty it's a pretty big effect compared to the average that that uh, happens. And in Britain, it's smaller, a six percent increase, with the average net swing being 9.6 percent, right? But there's still there's still significant effects. Essentially, this is the story that, that I need to work on to satisfy everybody empirically. But this is the kind of association that we're after, right? So all of this stuff, which may or may not have horribly confused you, right? Or made you feel like it wasn't about anything, right? <laughs> it had to do all this thinking about the way government processes these signals, right, has to pay off. Or else, there's no evidence that government would possibly think like this. And this is the beginning of establishing that kind of evidence. So that's where we are. Um, those are the conclusions. Um, and we think that we've, we've improved on those literatures in a few different ways, which I'm happy to talk about in Q&A. But you know, thanks to the Bedrosian Center for this money, because this is what we've been able to do. So Peter and I have uh, um, completed a book and a BJPS um, journal article on this. We've begun the data collection that you're seeing in this preliminary analysis with Spain here, but we were also able to bring in teams in Germany and, and Italy. And on the US case, um, we've actually, I've actually been able to use some of this money to start um, both collecting the data and, and do some meetings with uh, George Krauss. And we're going to try to look at the president's policy and in investment through the State of the Union, right? So thinking about the president as an, as an actor in this, in this process. One thing that's uh, interesting about that is there are arguments out there that the president doesn't engage, doesn't engage in representation in this way at all. So there's, there's, a, um, there's a possibility that uh, um, we can have a provocative finding in that literature as well. So thanks for your patience. All right. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to chat. I know I went on for a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, so when, when I was looking at that first graph you had about those three policy items, I think it was labor, macroeconomic, and environment. It seemed like environment is the one that really doesn't belong there because it feels like uh, I, my, my question is, do certain policy items crowd out other ones? Because when I look at something like that, you know, in 2008, 2009, it's, maybe they're not mutually exclusive. Right. You would guess that these would crowd out that. I mean, that's essentially what happened, but 
is there any link to policy items like that? Or yeah. this one tends to kind of you're, the, the, there, there is, and you're absolutely right that environment is the one that doesn't belong there. In, in British politics, we found almost no public value. We did a, 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 the original study, the one in the book, was between 1971 and 2000. We found almost no public valuation of, of environmental policy, right? And so it was almost always in, in, whatever, in whatever sort of shock to the state of the world, um, moved it onto the agenda. If you conditioned it out, it wasn't really worth <laughs> it. wasn't really worth anything. And the, in Spain, it's apparently, there is a little, now this, is just, this is just raw governmental attention. But again, it's apparently not as important as other things in, in, a, in a crisis. There is, there is some literature out there that looks at this as having a constraint. Right, so there's a there's it, it, one way of thinking about it is there's only enough, there's only so much space on the agenda, right? The Queen's speech is an interesting way to think about this because it's written a week in advance on vellum, and so it's really expensive, it's really time consuming, but essentially there's only so many policies you can talk about, and you're absolutely right that you get this kind of trade-off effect. In the way that we think about um, in the way that we think about risk risk does take into account these correlations between the values of these different um, of these different policies and so one part of risk is to consider that kind of um, that kind of trade-off explicitly but yes we do see those those kinds of things yeah right. anything else yeah I think uh, what else was it? Just speeches? Was it fell under the sort of platform setting? Mm. Okay, so we have in the project we have a we have a number of different ways that we can go with this. So these are these results are just based on speeches, two different speeches in Spain, right, and one in the UK, right. But we we can also look at laws, right. So the topics of the laws that are produced by Parliament, right? Right. Now, the, in reality, these should be very, very highly correlated in a, in a um, parliamentary system, particularly like the UK, right? Because it's basically the, the government has a monopoly on policy making, so it should get its bills through, through Parliament, right? So we should expect that would be very high. One of the um, advantages of looking at this, right? is that if you think about an executive speech versus bills, right? A bill may be about one specific thing or a collection of specific things. It might be about, it might be something that we could code, for example, in both environmental and health policy, right? Because it relates to safety due to environmental externalities, right? Um, so that can be coded in there, right? But, um, that may happen in one month, right? And then in another month, right, there may be a bill about something wildly different, right? Whereas at least with the executive agenda, these kinds of, these kind of promised bills that are coming out of high program to policy connection environments, we, we do expect to see, um, you know, we, we do expect to see multiple issues traded off, as you say, on the, on the uh, um, speech agenda that you wouldn't see with laws. Um, another, another effect that we're working on is the conditioning effect of the media as well, right? So, so the media gets, media stories get affected by the same state of the world revelations as um, public opinion does, right? And that effect might well be different. And so we want to, we want to take into account the extent to which public, or to, to which public opinion is conditioned by that part of media attention that is not explained by the same factors, right? And so we can, we can compare those two effects. So we're trying to work on something like that as well. So what about yeah. applying it to look at state governors in the US? Just look at yeah, you could. And Thad Kauser and I had a, had a brief conversation about whether or not you could you could do this with his data, and I, I do want to follow up with him at some point. But yeah, no, that's exactly right. Yeah, and some states, um, some states have uh, have 
more, um, if you will, effective veto players than, than others, yeah. right? So, yeah. so you can see some variation there. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like looking at the approval rating of Congress every now and then to see that, like, how it's stopped mm -hmm. pretty low. Rate. And I was wondering if, like, a lack of confidence or perceived credibility has an effect on the value that a legislature puts on a particular agenda item. Like, if they mm. have particularly low level of confidence, does that affect how they think? Well, you know that, it, and I deleted the slide, unfortunately. I do have something to tell you about that in the, uh, um, in the British context, right? So there's, a, um, there's a, something that's used in the, in the British literature um, that taps the extent to which, if you will, the prime minister runs ahead of his party. So it's prime ministerial par popularity less the party of the popularity of the government um, itself, right? Is that like the coalition or the party that he's really It was the in in the in the case, right? Exa it, in the in the book, I just had 1971 to 2000, so there was no coalition at all, right? It was just the prime minister and his own and his own party, right? So if the prime minister is more popular, right? It turns out that the effect of the um, the effect of the um, the uh, so at a certain point in that level of popularity, these policy agenda um, effects or these uh, policy portfolio effects start going away. So the prime minister's partisan popularity or his valence popularity is starting to crowd out the policy priorities, right? And that's what the, that's what the story's about. I wish I had the, the graph because it's kind of an interesting one, right? But the trade-off, and this we talk about a lot more in the book. I have no data in Spain to talk about that, so that's why I don't, I don't do it here. But we spend, we spend considerable attention thinking about um, the trade-off between just that kind of popularity, right, and these attempts to represent in terms of, in terms of policy attention. So yeah, it does have an effect. Yeah. How does your address multiple policy with equal priority? What do you mean with equal priority? Just the two policy areas and the government doesn't pay attention to either one of them, right? No, they usually yeah. um, already list, I think, of this. I think that these have to be equal. Mm -hmm. the, the government you know, says you know, health and environment are equal. Yeah. They address both. But in choosing to work on one first, they're not truly equal. Yeah, that's that's right. So it's not just so it's not just a trade-off, but we might it, like we might give, and on the low end, we particularly see it. You, you rarely do we give equivalently high attention, right, empirically, to um, the same or to different policy areas. But it's more on the low end, right? You know, we're not really paying attention to. Um, the environment, and we're not really paying attention to employment policy at this point either, right? And so the choice of how much, right, in the theory that we develop in the book, the, the, the choice of how much um, to prioritize a particular level is the choice of the government, and it's based on these kinds of signals. So if empirically it turns out that they're, they're paying attention at the same level, then that's just that's just what we that's just what we anticipate right the other thing that you mentioned actually is a data problem and this is something that I alluded to but it's hard to sort out because we we're using a coding framework that tries to d provide some defensible um, distinctions between these policy domains right but sometimes they're just not prioritized in one country at all, or there's no mention whatsoever. Or for example, the most, the, the most frequent time that, I, that I've run into this in this project is, say there's something that's really it, discussed in the British context, right? And it becomes one of the categories of the most important issue survey. And then you go to Spain and nobody mentions it because it's not an issue, right? And so some of these we can take care of because they may be 
controlled for by the fact that Britain and uh, Spain have, for example, different laws, right? Or different relationships to the EU, right? So that one, is, one issue is just technically off the table, right? But it's, it's a data problem in other ways if we, if we can't really do that, right? The way that, for example, the way that the Spanish talk about environmental policy is just simply different than the way that the British talk about environmental policy. Um, Britain and Spain, it's not so graphic. It's one of the reasons we picked these, but it's also one of the reasons why we don't use the Danish data, which are really quite good, and those guys are a great team. But, um, you know, in thinking about it initially, there are, there are some things that don't, don't translate quite as, quite as easily. Right. So. Mm -hmm. right. One more question? One more? No, I've... I've I've put you all to, into a state of slumber. Anyway, thanks for your attention.